Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. On the show today, we are very happy to welcome back to the show from uh, Angry Hamster Publishing, uh, Elizabeth Shiprata Kuhn. Uh, Liz, thank you for being back on. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, the last time that you were on, we ended up talking a whole lot about Bulbasaur. We did. I don't think we're going to fall into that trap this time as we did with Familiars of Terra. I, uh, because on this one, we're talking about a new game that you are going to be launching on Kickstarter very soon, uh, Afterlife Wandering Souls. And I get the feeling that this is uh, a, a little bit tonally different than Familiars yeah, of Terra. Yeah, it's very different. Um, okay. So basically, Afterlife Wandering Souls is uh, a game where you die, um, but you don't end up where you're meant to go. So you don't go to heaven, you don't go to hell, you don't get reincarnated. Instead, you take a long, dark boat ride to a scorching desert, and you have to wander the desert and go into different portals and different planes of existence trying to find memories of your past life, because you can't remember who you were. Is this like purgatory? It is a type of purgatory, yeah. Like, some people within the Tenebris, the Wanderers, those are like the PCs, they think that it's a purgatory, um, and that this is only kind of like a holding place till you prove yourself, kind of, and you get to move on. Um, but there's a lot of different belief systems within the Wanderers. I like the idea that I die at the beginning, so I don't feel bad that I've killed off my character. I mean, like, you can also die in the oh. Tenebris. So you can, like, <laughs> die again, and no one really knows what happens to you. But there's some mechanical stuff that can prevent you from winning the Darwin Award. Okay. So a second death. You die once, and then you have a second death. Yeah. So, so when you die the second time, can you come back from the dead dead? There's a couple of mechanical things that we've built into the game, um, which we can get into. But basically, if you reach zero health, um, instead you can lose a permanent point of will. And your will is kind of your character's um, motivation to move, like, c to continue their journey. Um, and if you instead remove a permanent point of will, you basically get to regain a little bit of health and continue playing. Um, and kind of just realize that you messed up so deeply that you almost kind of ended your journey. Um, but oh. when you die, die, um, normally people don't come back. But there's a couple of secrets that we have about that, which you can uncover in the book, because I don't want to spoil it. But something does happen to you when you die. Die. The Reaper laughs at you for dying again. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like you That's just get you now. just get laughed <laughs> laughed at. Bulbasaurs plant you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried, um, <laughs> and we failed. This this actually kind of reminds me about the idea of the two deaths. You know, like the the one death that you leave your physical form, and then you have a, another death where people the last time anyone uh, says your name. Oh yeah, I know that concept. Yes, but it feels like your character has a little bit more agency when it comes to dying uh, for a second time. Yeah. So this. basically, like, unless you think, like, you know, within the game, like, okay, this is a really fitting end for my character. Um, mm. you normally have the chance to come back, right? So it's kind of down right. to you as a player. Um, and also, I guess, like, if you're a player who just consistently has a death wish and continues dying, at one point you're going to run out of will, right? And your character is just going to die, die. I hate when I die, die. <laughs> Sometimes you, so, so basically, you run out of the will to live. Yes, but you can also... So if you run out of your will before you run out of your health, you actually become... Um, you gain points called stagnation, which are basically your character yeah, kind of giving up the will to continue. Um, and if you get three points of stagnation, you become someone called an unrequited. And those people are wanderers who are kind of corrupted by the Tenebris. Um, and your character essentially becomes an unplayable antagonist. They become a bad guy? Yeah. So it's not even so much either you die the hero or you live long enough to become the villain. Now I, I die and also become the villain in death essentially yes. um but oh or or have the possibility to find a true ending right because every okay. wanderer is kind of searching for pieces of themselves searching for mm. their memories and trying to come to terms with who they were and once you do that 
um, you actually get to find something called your Requiem, which is like kind of your end, wanderers okay. believe. Um, and they do that by unlocking death marks. And death marks are tattooed like sigils on your body. Um, and each of oh, them yeah. are connected to a memory. Um, so mechanically, you unlock them through certain certain things. And once you've unlocked all nine, you take the final journey, basically, which is kind of what all wanderers want, besides for becoming a villain or die dying. <laughs> Right, you come to an actual end. Yeah, an actual, like, or, and, and most Wanderers believe it's a positive end, whatever they believe about what the Requiem could be. I, like, suddenly have the idea that you could do, like, a, a music video with a bunch of songs from the early 2000s that just fit this so well. <laughs> Are any, any songs in particular that we can say uh, if we have Thanks for the Memories, okay. Fall Out Boy. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Final countdown. I was gonna go with free fallen. The final free fallen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it just came to my head, and I was like, "Wow, that's that's fitting." Or wanted dead or alive. <laughs> I feel like Bon Jovi would be all over yeah. this. It's my I life. Make, like... Oh no. <laughs> It's yeah, that works. Yeah, that's good. I make like playlists for when I'm writing, um, and my afterlife playlist has none of these songs. But I do feel now that I need to make a super campy 2000s afterlife playlist <laughs> because these songs are very fitting. Yes, <laughs> some of them are, are pre 2000s or post 2000s, but you know it's it's fine. Just you, you call it that. It's all it good. all counts. You could have like a whole uh, music video that you make for the for the for the Kickstarter. And it just, it just, it looks like that kind of like VCR grain, like nineties. I don't, I don't think she's got the money to license those songs for a Kickstarter video. Honestly, well, it would, it would have to be like an off-brand version. It's not oh, free falling. It's like, hey, I'm falling here. But then it, <laughs> but then it would just be, anyway. It would sound a little bit close to it. Food for thought. Uh, I was wondering, though, uh, you were talking about how you can lose will. What would cause me to lose will in the game? Um, okay, so basically you can take damage. Um, when you fail a check in Afterlife, um, you have two options. Uh, like, things get worse, and in that case you'll, you can take damage or the GM can introduce a plot twist. Or you can suffer a break, which is a different thing. But taking damage, um, you have three different pools, actually, that you can take damage from. Your health, your hunger, and your will. Um, your health is just very straightforward. Most RPGs have it. You take damage. Right. Your hunger is actually your character's means, like how much money they have, but also how much supplies they have. So, for example, that would be... Um, yeah, someone steals from you. Okay, lose a point of hunger. You know what I mean? They steal your supplies. Mm -hmm. And then will damage, um, like we were talking about, is your character's motivation to go on and essentially their hope. So, for example, if you experience something like you're, um, let's say you're trying to like pep someone up, you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. not to get too dark, but they're standing on a ledge and they're about to jump, right? Um, sure. And you're trying to talk them off the ledge and you end up failing. Yeah. And okay. they jump off. That would be a time where I'd be like, all right, hey, sorry, but you lose one. And I would even argue like two to three points of will because of that. So are these people that you're interacting with uh, still in the living world or is everyone that you're interacting with in this afterlife? So they're all in the afterlife and there's two parts of it. So there's the Tenebris, uh, that's that desert we talked about. And within the Tenebris, sure. there's um, places called mirages, which you can think of like cities, forests, towns, and things like that. And they mm -hmm. all have their own unique inhabitants who know that they live in the Tenebris. They know that there's wanderers and wanderers think this is some type of afterlife, but that's all these people have known. Um, yeah. And then you have separate portals within the Tenebris going to places called limbos. And limbos are separate planes of existence that are kind of their own thing. So, for example, I just ran a game last night where they went to this place called Everdark with a giant moon and shapeshifters. And these people Ooh. within these worlds, they don't know that there's something beyond it. They don't understand what wanderers are. But these strange worlds basically are where wanderers can actually find, they can find memories of their past lives because they feel that just beyond these worlds, there's something that they want to go to. So they kind of like taste the heaven, the hell, the whatever you want to call it, behind the worlds. Oh. So do the people that don't know there's anything other than this, have they like always existed there from a lore standpoint? Or are these like people who don't necessarily remember their 
lives before this. From a lore standpoint, like if you go into that world, they completely believe that they've been there forever, that this is their home. Like, for example, like you could imagine Earth would be a limbo, right? Like we think Earth has existed for X billions of years after the Big Bang and things like that. Most of us do. Yeah, m- most of us do. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> and other beliefs as well. But like Yeah, the the whole idea of being able to move through these worlds is very uh interesting. I'm curious about like the uh the starting point at which you said we're gonna do afterlife wandering souls. How does that process <laughs> actually start for you that you were like, you're gonna walk through the worlds of the dead, you're going to find an end and there's gonna be memories. What is the start of that thought process? Well, like how after I started is that I wanted to do something with dead people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, like it's like Co- context is gonna be really good for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Context matters. Yeah. So basically, you know, I, I think that like death in as a concept can and and I don't mean this in a a glorifying way, but at least like the state of death not particularly dying is sometimes like a romanticized concept. And like, you know, you can tell pretty beautiful stories about ghosts kind of looking on on their past lives, or even when you think about like, you know, vampires and like watching through the ages. Um, So I wanted to do a, uh, I wanted to do a game about dead people. (laughs) Um, And that kind of was the genesis of the the, um, the game. And then I started yeah. playing around with a couple of concepts like, oh, maybe I could include the seven deadly sins and things like that. But then I didn't want to make mm-hmm. it so Western centric. And right. eventually my weird mind turned to all these different planes because I kind of thought about the type of game I like playing. And Ooh. normally I like an overarching plot, but I also very much like my character have a storyline. Um, yeah. So for me, I wanted to give these dead people like a motivation a very clear motivation that they had to collect all their memories and they have to do that by adventuring. Um, And that's Mm. kind of how the concept was developed. The interesting thing for me would be like, if I'm playing uh, like, like my D and D or something and I have my character and my character dies because uh, they, they rolled natural ones too much when they were on death saves. I feel like afterlife wandering souls is the game you could play with that character after they have officially died wherever they were. <laughs> and this is now the quest that they're going on. I kind of conceptualize it in that way. Yeah. And I mean, I think it, it also gives you a lot of opportunities. Because one thing I like is I like like the kind of big adventures, but sometimes what I miss in certain role-play games um, is kind of those poignant emotional moments. Like you can have them in a lot of games, but your GM really has to focus on them. Um, but mm-hmm. in Afterlife, in order to actually move on and progress with your character, you have to have those emotional moments. So you have to have that memory of like talking with your daughter or like, you know, like having a good time with your best friend and then messing up. Um, right. So I can imagine like within that concept of like your D&D character dying, it would also maybe be a cool retrospective to then kind of go back and play through some of those moments that you maybe didn't have on screen. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so many different interesting things that you can do with this. Uh, I actually like the idea of the death marks, you know, those tattoo-like things that you get on your body. Because usually in games, when you have a tattoo, it usually means something significant. It means or, I got inked. You came across a giant squid? I don't know why there aren't more games that you just have tattoos because you like tattoos like you do in real life, but that's okay. Um, here, Here is a question about the death marks, though. Do they give your character any sort of anything or are they purely just attached to the memory no so they um basically when you go through character creation character creation actually happens in game um and it's on that boat ride that you take from the world of the living to the world of the dead um and you end up rolling um on random charts for memories and then you as a character get to describe how you reacted to them um and based on how you react you get a death mark um so you get nine death marks and each death mark is connected to that memory that you experience, but they each also have a mechanical benefit. Like, for example, like one could give you a free point of will back per day um, mm. and things like that. So when your character actually gets the chance to unlock a death mark, you're not only choosing a memory that you want to relive at that moment, but you're also choosing a power that you want to unlock. So in the end, you'll have nine unique powers for your character. Ooh, oh, wow. that's fancy. I like that. Who doesn't like powers that are locked on tattoos of memories 
It, it's it's great. And then they can glow. In my mind, the tattoos then glow. That's I mean, what I want. why not, right? Like, you're yeah, in control exactly. of, kind of what your character's tattoos look like. Um, yeah. I kind of leave that up to how people describe them because it's a personal thing, right? Like, some people might just yeah. want a few small ones. Some people might want to be completely inked up. Like, it's up to you. Yeah. If you want to. I mean, there's a forked tongue tattoo, and I believe there's a snake one as well. We have, like, over 100 death marks, so... There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of tattoos. I, I that it's so smart though of you to create uh to do character creation in game. I like that idea yep. that like I'm essentially building my character as I go on this ride and answer questions. I love rolling character creations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, instead of just rolling up a sheet and saying I think this is my character, actually like just giving the character experiences uh, and explaining the character, and then that becomes the character. Yeah, I was I was heavily inspired by. Have you guys ever played BattleTech? Like, not the newest edition, but the older edition. I have not. Okay, I have not either. It is it's it's a war game, but like it, it was one of the funnest character creation experiences I've ever had. Because basically, you start from like being born, and you just have to like decide how your character like. Like, were you destitute? Were you rich? And basically, their their character creation is a bit different. But basically, you get to make choices and you have, like, a set dice pool. Um, and you say, like, okay, I want to try to get my, like, poor destitute character into university. And then you get to roll for it and, like, horrible things can befall your character. Like, at one point, like, I lost an arm during character creation. But it was, wow. it's such a fun thing. Like, I just recommend, like, spending a couple hours and making a Battletech character because it is bomb. Yeah. Is this, like, a uh, Dead Earth where your character can die in character creation? You can't die, yeah. but there is, like, I mean, you can come out of it pretty scarred. Basically, they want you to get to a certain age. So I think you have to get to, like, 17 or 18, and then you can stop with character creation. But I wanted to make, like, a veteran, so I ended up going to, like, 60. Oh, so wow. she had seen some things, you know? <laughs> like, she uh, she had seen a couple, of, a couple of bad things, and she had lost an arm. But, yeah. I mean, it was still playable Ooh. in the end, but I think you can get to, like, if you're that unlucky with rolling, even though you have edges to kind of move your... Um, you move your choices up and down um, that your character's pretty unplayable or very difficult to play compared to everyone else. I just kind of like the yeah. idea that you're essentially telling the story of the character and that also informs what the character does. Like the story informs the mechanics right up at the front when you have that first journey essentially with them. Yeah, exactly. And like in Afterlife, at least like based on how you answer. So you kind of get like an A, B and C and then like the GM will ask you to kind of role play and expand a little bit on your choice. That kind of informs the stats that your character gets as well, um, because they're split up into like body, mind and soul. So are you doing something more physically like motivated, more like mentally thinking or something more with your emotions and your charisma? I would be interested to see a character that's trying to use their physical strength in the afterlife continuously. I will challenge you to an arm wrestling competition. Would you like to try that right now? <laughs> that might be a little tricky. I don't know how that works in the afterlife. I mean, I, I feel like they probably can physically interact with the environment, Nathan, so I think it's still doable. Can they interact with each other in the afterlife? Like, yeah. in a... a somewhat corporeal it's it's kind of hard to do a whole rpg type thing if you can't physically interact with anything i don't know i, I mean it try. might be a cool concept to do that but um that that would be a, a difficult thing i'd have to like inhabit corporeal things i'd, I'd have to like possess I've played that game, too, <laughs> where, you, where you just have to possess other objects in order to actually interact with the world uh, so the tenebris sight. is like a very physical thing i mean even though there's like pretty fantastical elements there it's basically mm. like our world so you can interact with them and also you get a crew so each wanderer uh, when they take the boat ride there's other people um, on the boat with them and obviously that's your fellow players um, and you sure. form a crew so you kind of form a group of people who took the boat ride together and who kind of stick with one another for protection because the tenebris is a dangerous place uh, when you were uh, developing the idea of the boat ride, were you kind of thinking about like the river sticks and the and the ferryman? That... Oh yeah. Can the characters mutiny on the ferry, for instance, and throw the ferry master over? 
Uh, they can try, but at that point, they don't really have stats yet. So, and, you know, I think that the boat person is kind of this uh, enigmatic, almost godlike figure. At least that's how I imagine the boat person. Um, so, that's like, I, I, I don't think they're going to be able to. Um, as a GM, I would just kind of, like, affect then the type of memories that they have, because you have a little bit of uh, leeway there to, like, in narrating things. And uh, and the worst thing is, if you actually were able to throw the ferryman off or convince your GM to do so, uh, now you're literally just a, a bunch of statless characters trying to deal with this world. Well, I mean, I can foresee characters that would try to do that and players that would try to do that, but I can also Ooh. see the characters who would come back to that later when they're super powerful or whatever and they've got tons of stuff going on and be like, Yo, ferryman! Try to get back on the boat and go back? No, uh, maybe, or or beat them up. I don't know. Players are weird. <laughs> I, don't, I don't... Well, you know, two silver dollars is, is you know, he's probably pretty rich. If, you know, if you, you have <laughs> Yeah, to by, by the, the time you want to go and beat him up, he's retired. He's just like, nope, done. He's retired to a beach <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> In one of the realms of the afterlife. Um... Yeah, no, you have to imagine that he's probably pretty, pretty loaded. But I don't really know what your end goal would be, Alex. You know, I don't, I don't. I'm just asking for clarification of people who might want to do it. I know there are people who will try. I know there will. I don't think you can't go back across on the ferry, right? And then just try to go back to the real world, <laughs> to your life before. No, so that's not um, a part of of afterlife. Basically, like going back to your old life, like that. That's not within the realm yeah. of the game you're playing basically right so like right. i can imagine that you will have characters who are like oh we need to try to get back there's some way to get back but eventually you know if they don't actually start their journey towards um the beyond towards their requiem they're gonna end up losing will right like because you're just trying to get back rather than moving forward it's maybe not implicitly said but it is implied that you have uh, nothing to gain by going back, but you have a lot to lose if you don't move forward. <laughs> exactly, and and there's nothing there's nothing within the lore um, that we've built into the game that really says like you should try this. You know what I mean? Or that's what the game's about. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, before we get too far into this about uh, the dice system that you built for this, uh, because uh, I believe you were saying that the dice system that you built for Afterlife you plan on using in more games from Angry Hamster going forward. I do, yeah. So I, I've taken some time, you know, I've freelanced a lot, and now I'm, I've come to a dice system I'm really happy with. So the goal is, like, this is kind of our... Our first version of the dice system, because Afterlife is a somewhat standalone game, though, like, there's a lot you can do to expand on it. Um, and then going forward in our line, we're going to use the same dice system. Um, obviously not the death marks and stuff, because that's unique to Afterlife, but the same base mechanics sure. will be in our games going forward. So I'm really excited okay. about it. Excellent. What is that dice system? Tell me a little bit about it. All right. So basically, everything um, for your character is centered around their core. Um, and your core has three stats. It's your body, mind, and soul. Body has strength, stamina, and uh, dexterity. And then basically what you do, any check that you make is always rolling your core stat plus whatever your number is in your attribute in D6s. And if you roll a four to a six, it's a success. And you need a certain amount of successes in order to meet the challenge and make your check. Next to that, you have something called concept pools, and your concept pools are derived from your core. And basically what your concept pools are, are like extra currency that your character has to spend on certain checks. So they're both, they're all linked to the body, mind, and soul. And you have a certain amount of points that you can give yourself automatic successes. So for example, if you fail at a check, let's say you needed two successes and you only get one, you could spend a point um, from your body, for example, if you're using a body check in order to get an additional success and make your check a success. That's balanced with the fact that when your character fails and things get worse, so either you take damage or the GM introduces a plot twist, you actually gain experience. So you gain experience in order to up your um, up your stats later. So you kind of have to decide for yourself what you want to do, like whether it's really necessary at this point and you really need the success or you're like, you know what? I'm just going to see what chaos ensues now that I've failed my check. And just go with it. Just yeah. see what happens. <laughs> when you have to invest points uh, in from like your, your strength 
are those points that you ever regain? Is there something that happens to your character if they they do not have those points of strength? Yeah. So basically you have um, next to your core, you have your concept pools. Those are the ones that you can spend and you have your vitality pools. Your concept pools can get completely empty because your concept pools are just extra currency that you have to spend. And when you take a rest, they all refill. Um, but your vitality pills that we talked about earlier, your health, your hunger, and your will, when those empty, each one of them has a dire consequence. And actually when you rest, you can only refill one of those pools. So I have to figure out if I'm using one heavily in order to do things, that would be the one that I'd want to refill probably. When, when yeah, I well, like if you rest. took a lot of health damage, then you'd probably choose that. But Or you could say, because sure. um, every character has a different amount of health, hunger, and will. So you sure. could have four health um, and two will, for example, as permanent ratings, and you took three points of damage in your health and one point of damage in your will. But because you don't want to lose hope, you may choose to heal your will pool instead because you're like, well, you know what? I, I'll, just stay, I'll just stay away from getting hit you know, tomorrow. So there's a little bit of strategy that comes with that. Uh, I can tell like how, how I'm going to be playing uh, after my rest, like next day is going to be dependent on what I, what I decide to replenish. Yeah, exactly. And I think that should also kind of inform your role play decisions because like, for example, if you're still completely beaten up, but you're feeling a bit better, you know, it's mm. like maybe like, Oh, I'm still going to go along with a group, but I'm just going to stay farther back and things like that. Right. I kind of I I do like that because it gives a little bit more strategy to resting than I see in a lot of RPGs where it's just like, yeah, you're rested and everything's back. Like it's just I know I got to get to a rest so that I can regain everything. In this one, I really have to think about how I'm going to utilize that break. How how did you come up with that idea? What was the genesis of that model? It's actually, so I had started Afterlife because I had like the thematic concept of it very quickly mm. after Witch. Um, but then like dealing with like dark selling souls and like death and stuff kind of got me a little down. So I started working on Familiars of Terra as like a palate cleanser. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, okay. That came after you yeah, started. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like mm -hmm. Afterlife took a bit of a break just because I was like, I need I need a break. I need to think about cool animals for a bit. Um, but during that time, I had started kind of working on a dice system for a game based on martial arts because I had kind of, I really wanted to make a game um, about kind of Asian culture by all Asian people because I thought that would be really awesome. Yeah. Um, so I had started making this dice system um, based on just martial arts because I thought it would be fun and I wanted a solid dice system and I wanted everything linked together with one another so that it all kind of flowed and made sense um, and that concept for that game kind of went on the back burner because I realized I didn't have a strong enough concept for it but I really liked the dice system and I'm like hey this would work for Afterlife, too. <laughs> and so here we go. We're, yeah. we're in. And so Afterlife was born. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, it, it, it ended up fitting really well. I was really happy with it. Oh, that's kind of neat, though. You know, you you were working on a project, then you went off and did another project, but then you kind of got inspired to do something for, for the project that you started with. Yeah, exactly. Like, I always wanted Afterlife to be made. It's just I needed to not live in the thought of like death and traumatic memories for a while i just need to think about animals and adventuring <laughs> yeah. as one does bulbasaur yep, yes. bulbasaur. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> do not take your bulbasaur as into the afterlife do. <laughs> don't, no. don't do that no, no. so sad oh man i wish i had had a death mark that looked like a bulbasaur now there aren't any death marks that look like it doesn't matter. So you have uh, three different pools and then they uh, they do different things. And I'm guessing that depending on what game you end up making out of this, those three pools might be called different things, might represent different things. Exactly. Yeah. And then all the things around it. So like in Afterlife, you have a bunch of different things. Like you have something called an approach, which is like this weapon that you get given by the boatman and it's different depending on your stats. And you have things called talents, which are like magical abilities and you have death marks, like all that extra stuff will all be completely different for each, uh, each game. Because essentially all those things give you things like bonus dice or like 
points back in your pools, at least like when you strip them down and you just look at them mechanically. So even like the weapons and how I'm approaching situations uh, links back to that initial boat ride, essentially, when I'm going and creating my character. Yeah, so your approach um, ends up, you can be a sword, a shield, or a bow. Um, and obviously that's linked to the body, mind, and soul. It all goes back to kind of how your character deals with situations and the memories that they're presented with. Um, and then you get one of these weapons, or at least people call them approaches, because the approaches can be kind of fantastical elements. So for example, you can have a shield that's actually just like a bubble that you're in, for example, or like oh. a bow that helps you wayfind rather than actually shoot people. So uh, is the bow representative of mind? Yeah. Okay. I Can you thinking. guess the other two? <laughs> uh, sword for soul and shield for body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, oh. it's, it's actually so, uh, soul. A uh, shield for soul and sword for body. Oh, okay. Okay. I just think like because I I, I guess I was thinking because I I put a shield in front of my body so that I don't get hurt. <laughs> oh, fair. fair. <laughs> that was what I was thinking, and I figured. Maybe sword, because I need a lot of soul in order to swing this damn thing. <laughs> that is probably my thought process. That's your thought process. You're going to be the stylish, most stylish wanderer. Yeah, I really, yeah, I have to be a very stylish wanderer. But that also makes sense, because I might need a shield. Uh, the shield is like my, my soul. I can kind of understand that. So that makes sense. And I need to have hit points if I'm going to be going in with a sword. Yeah, that would help that. quite a bit. So how do you see this implemented? Obviously, there are uh, projects that are on the horizon that you have not uh, really even conceived of yet. How, like, some of the other possibilities of how you could use this system in, in other games, have you thought about some of the other applications? Um, yeah, so basically, for example, um, we have a game that we're developing after Afterlife. <laughs> After Afterlife. After Afterlife? That's, that's a good... After that's, After Hours. That, that's your splat book. <laughs> after <laughs> um, And it's actually based um, around... It's a modern fantasy setting where you play elves who are actually protectors of reality. Um, so you're kind of charged by reality to make sure any kind of deviations don't harm mortals. So we're using the same type of system in essence, which will like, it'll have all the pools and stuff because it's kind of a basic system that you can copy and paste. But then character creation is slightly different because as an elf, the stats you get, because again, we do character creation in game, the stats you get are based on your legacy because you're reborn every generation. Um, oh. And it's based on your past, your past lives and what they've done. Um, so like you could have been an utter failure or you could have been the biggest hero. Those kind of inform the stats you have. And you kind of play through your past lives and decide when you want to stop because you start and you need at least three legacies, right? We say like every character starts with a base because we don't want people so weak compared to everyone else. Um, but you can go up to 10, 10 pieces of legacy if you want. So then you kind of start betting um, on your character creation. And the more steps backwards you do, the more chance you have for getting something negative in your past. Um, so that's kind of how we would like transport the, at least the character creation aspect of the mechanics onto a new game. Well, yeah, I can definitely see a lot of possibilities for using that system uh, into the future because I I feel like those those initial pools are disambiguous enough that you could apply them in different ways depending on on what you want to make. Yeah, like it, it's a solid like, you know, like we've we've done a lot of testing and it's like, OK, people get enough successes and enough failures to make the game interesting. But it, once you strip away all the titles, you can really add a lot of different things. For example, like with the elves, maybe they don't have a will pool, but they have something like courage or honor, for example, a pool that right. they're going to be able to draw from. It sounds like from the way you're describing it, it's a system that really encourages a lot of strategy on how you're going to approach situations you know do i want to try and turn my failures into successes am i going to take those failures how am i going to uh, replenish my pools what what do i want to use and it feels like it gives the players a lot of agency in that on how they want to go forward yeah it's all about how much you're willing to risk basically mm. everything everything <laughs> 
Alex is going to risk it all. Alex is going to be the first person to just use all their will really fast. Yep. <laughs> he's, put it all in black. He's Yeah, he's just going to pull it off. Red 21, he's going to put all of his will right on it, spin the roulette wheel, and see what happens. It was nice playing with you, Luck Alex. Luck favors the bold. Well, I don't know if that's true Luck in is, RPGs. Um, <laughs> Luck is disambiguous to the bold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably closer to true. Um, Luck isn't real and you're making things up. <laughs> Luck is in an open relationship with the bull. That is also true. <laughs> we we reserve the right to, <laughs> to end it at any time. <laughs> I can see I can see someone waiting waiting around for Luck to come and they just get a text message, sorry I'm at my other lover's house tonight. <laughs> and they're just like, Welp. <laughs> New destiny who dis? What? No. Because <laughs> the phone. No, you ruined it, Nathan. No, well, that's what I'm good at. I do get the <laughs> I do get the feeling like the system that you've built is uh more about story driven gameplay over like combat. On it, to me, it kind of reminds me uh in a similar fashion of fate. Not like fate itself but like how fate is very story driven for that it's uh, reminiscent of that to me yeah indeed like it, it's definitely it's all kind of motivated by by the story and what your character wants to accomplish and whether or not they can do that and every time you succeed or fail it, it's meant to drive the story forward rather than be like okay i i hit that person that they have a couple of points of damage and we'll see what happens next round um so your actions have a bigger reaction than something like a classic d20 D, &D. Um, like when you make a check to try to stab someone like you're going to legitimately stab them and it's probably going to be a really terrible wound yeah i guess that's the question i should have asked too is is there actually like a combat system like we would normally imagine or is it a little bit like am i rolling for initiative or is it not not really like that no so basically it just you just take turns because actually the gm doesn't roll anything in this game i, sh I probably should have oh. led with that <laughs> We'll just edit it into the front of the episode. Yeah. By the way, By the, the GM way, doesn't roll anything. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's fine. Okay, so the GM doesn't roll anything. No, so it's all based on players players making checks, which is why it can be so dire when you fail a check um, and you have those points if you need to use them because basically when things get worse, I could be like, okay, well, a bunch of enemies show up and they surround you guys. What are you going to do now? Um, so it can mm -hmm. make it infinitely harder and harder for your character to to get out of whatever situation that they're in. So the uh, the entire time that you're in the game, are you uh, are you pretty much in each player's turn? Like one player does something, yeah. then another player does something. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Like yeah. Sorry. Going back to what you said about initiative. Um, so basically, like each player takes a turn, like where it makes sense. Like obviously, like we have some advice in the game. Like ever let everyone go before you go. Um, but in some cases, of course, like, I think everyone at the table would be like, no, dude, like, roll again. Like, we understand you need to get out of that, like, death grip, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm being strangled to death. Nope, it's my turn. Yeah. Sorry. It's like, listen, we all don't have a good idea how to get you out of the strangle. So just please writhe harder, you know? <laughs> Yeah, could you rise more intensely and you know really if we could just see some drama in your in your eyes that would be terrific. Um yeah, don't go adventuring with that party. No. <laughs> That's no. not a party you want to deal with. Um they're they're not your friends and they have no soul points at all. <laughs> Sorry. They are not shields. They are not shields. Nope. Going back to afterlife for a second. Those gateways to other places are those fleshed out in the book what like what those places are can you tell me a little bit about them yeah so in the game we actually have two chapters um we have one which has all the limbos so those are the different worlds and then we have one which has a bunch of different mirages um and they take up about a fourth of the book um in total so you have a lot of setting to work oh, okay. with and they're mm -hmm. all kind of strange not surreal places, but they're very, you know, Del Toro, Tim Burton-esque type worlds. Oh, okay. um, yeah. They okay. have a sense of the macabre to them, um, and they're all a little bit dark. Um, but that being said, um, I've been playing a campaign now for a year with my home players just to test everything. And they, they also went to a Jello world. So 
but you know it, it's kind of down to uh it's it's down to the gm in the end because we give advice on how to make your own worlds but at least the ones in the game very much fit okay. the setting of afterlife but nothing's stopping you from putting your players in a jello world because you think it'd be hilarious oh yeah there's going to be gummy bears in mine oh, i no. can totally see uh, cannibalistic yeah. gummy bears <laughs> there's the cannibalistic Cannibal- gummy I mean, bears so they- so they eat each other. Yeah, but because yeah. that's delicious. I mean, if you if everyone was literally made out of gummies, would you not be tempted? Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't rightfully say I have an answer to that. <laughs> Alex would like to neither confirm nor deny that he would eat other people if they were made of gummy bears. <laughs> oh, only if they were made of gummy bears. Yeah. Oh, okay, totally. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I thought we weren't talking about specifically that. <laughs> Sorry, we should have explained that better to you, Alex. <laughs> I uh, I didn't want to confirm or deny eating people being a hobby of mine. That's oh, thing. no. If they were made of gummies. That's, uh, they that's, were made of that's gummies. a mildly different. But you're also a gummy. So now how do you feel I mean, about it? Gummy bears are delicious. Can can some of them be vodka infused gummy bears? Oh, my God. I mean, I guess you could infuse yourself, right? There's probably bars where you just like lay in a martini glass. <laughs> oh my goodness, that sounds amazing. I could just I could just see like one gummy bear that has eaten all the other gummy bears and they were all filled with vodka and he's just sitting there completely intoxicated and inebriated, rolling around, floating in a in a sea of his own contentment. I'll tell you a thing or two. No, about it's a gummy sea bears. of vodka, Nathan. It's a sea of vodka. Yeah. Also known as his own contentment. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that that's a mixed drink alex it's a it's your own contentment it's basically vodka with a vodka shot inside of it uh inside of a uh, gummy bear obviously. inside of a gummy bear that you put into the into the vodka martini just a straight gotcha. vodka martini with a gummy bear that also has Sounds vodka in like it. A fun time. But you know, if you didn't want to do that, which I don't know why you wouldn't, you could also have modeled them after after like the uh, the afterlives of like uh, e- Egyptian mythology or uh, Greek mythology. You could you could do that too if you want to be a traditionalist. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the game, we try to offer. Um like more unique settings um, that people couldn't like kind of research themselves and develop for themselves. Um, Like, you know, like the traditional kind of Greek um, type concepts and things like that. But for sure, like we even say that in the game that maybe you step into a place that looks exactly what kind of Abrahamic heaven is stereotyped to look like. Right. Sure. And you have to wander the clouds for ages. Yeah. And then talk to some angels or I don't know, see your grandma. Are all the angels named Erica? Uh, I, yeah. yeah huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't get that reference, Alex. That's a Night Vale reference right there. That all the angels are named Erica. I, I just wanted to know if it, that's because they have name tags. It says, hi, I'm an angel. My name is Erica. <laughs> but No, because old woman Josie told us. I'm running four games for the gauntlet of Afterlife uh, on this related to the... Um, the Kickstarter, and cool. I just played in a game where they went into a limbo, and there was all these black snakes, and they were all named Carla. Like, no joke. All of the snakes <laughs> were named Carla. It's, it's very similar. <laughs> yeah. And the, the snakes had a little name tag and said, hi, my name is Carla. That'd be so is there any cute. chance that they were on a plane as well? <laughs> Call Samuel L. Jackson. We've got oh, a bunch God. of snakes named Carla, and they're on my plane. <laughs> Oh no, poor, poor Carlos. And we're already in the afterlife, so somebody probably already got bit. <laughs> Sorry. But on the other hand, I could just go to, like, the Field of Reeds from, from Egyptian mythology, and <laughs> then I'd just have to deal with, like, jackal guards or something like that. Honestly, I'm surprised you didn't say some sort of, like, Bulbasaur heaven. Oh my god, wouldn't Bulbasaur heaven be amazing? Would it be like similar to dog heaven, but just filled with Bulbasaurs? Just filled with, yeah, just filled with Bulbasaurs. That would, though, beg a really important question. Does does every Pokemon have their own version of heaven? Uh, Can you imagine, like, the Mr. Mime heaven? I would not want to go there. (laughs) Oh my god, just invisible walls everywhere. (laughs) So horrible. (laughs) Everywhere you go, that would be terrible. And oh, I, I imagine that every Pokemon has its own version of hell, at least. Oh yeah, probably. And there's probably just a Charizard there. But, but then that does beg a question too. When the Bulbasaur evolves into an Ivysaur, is there now an Ivysaur heaven? Maybe there's just a sore heaven. There's a sore heaven. Oh, okay. Like maybe that whole evolution line gets one. That would be okay. 
That way Psyducks and Golducks can be in the same place at the same time. That way Gyarados and Magikarp can just, just swim through Although where does they Ditto want. go? Does Ditto have its own um, heaven or does it go to other... Oh, wow. This is... You, you know what? Ditto probably has the same heaven that all of the legendaries have. Because oh. he's in the same egg group as all the legendaries. Oh, heaven's by egg group, too. That'd be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> There's like or, a hierarchy to heavens in Pokemon universe. We gotta get Dante back to write this. <laughs> 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 we, gotta, we gotta update Inferno and Paradisio. Sorry. <laughs> we need to do this for Pokemon. I think Ditto honestly probably has the afterlife with those gummy bears. <laughs> Oh, I, think, no. I think that's where he wants to go anyway. Here, here's a really quick question while we're on this topic exactly. What happens if I want to take my familiar from Terra and have them wander the afterlife? What if those are the characters? I think the question would probably be, because um, in Familiars of Terra, there's a lot of different belief systems. Um, so some people believe that actually you're two parts of one soul. So then I would imagine that in the afterlife, you'd kind of become one person. Um, or like, do you believe you're two separate entities or whatever? And then I would argue if you are two separate entities, it might be more interesting to have someone play you and someone play your familiar, right? I smell a spinoff. <laughs> <laughs> That's April after Fools. afterlife. We <laughs> That was after afterlife. That we, we were... That's the familiar afterlife <laughs> is what you would call it. It's so funny the amount of people I've spoken to about this concept. who has been like, this would be a great game for after your first game and I was like I, I know I should have thought about this like years ago when I first started working on the concept but it never occurred to me till I started promoting the game and people were like yeah you know like after your characters die and I was like oh yeah that makes sense because I made a game about dead people <laughs> oops <laughs> you just have see the trick is that you do the next one like next year or so and you're like hey i did this and i did that and now i'm making a crossover edition that lets you do both those things combined in a way and people will buy that too then okay i yeah if, if you say people will buy it i'll do it <laughs> i mean don't quote me on that but uh <laughs> they bought familiars of terra and i assume they're gonna buy this so uh, the thought is that that would continue as a trend especially if they like the first two I hope so. I mean, the Kickstarter nightmares have started, and if the nightmares are true, you are a liar. But <laughs> <laughs> you, you, well, you know what you do is you create an entire uh, role-playing game cinematic universe. Oh, I like that, like the MCU. Yeah, exactly. You can do Afterlife v Terra, Dawn of Justice, and uh, <laughs> no. then from there, <laughs> so you just there... said the worst. <laughs> absolute worst movie tie-in you could do to anything, Nathan. The Winter Bulbasaur. The Winter Bulbasaur. <laughs> Bulbasaur Civil War. Bulbasaur Civil, Civil War. War. <laughs> oh my god, it's just Pikachu and Bulbasaur having like the most intense argument that ruins everyone's lives. And it's totally done with them speaking only their names. Yes! Oh my god. Yes! <laughs> You know, if somebody doesn't redo a poster of Civil War with just Pokemon on it, I am going to feel bad. Somebody's I feel like you could just that. use the artwork from, like, Pokemon Stadium for that. Are we sure this doesn't exist? You have your cover art for the episode now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know exactly what I'm doing for the cover art. It's, uh, it'll be titled Bulbasaur Civil War, and then in parentheses underneath it, it'll be, um... The actual name of the, the episode. Afterlife Wandering Souls. Bulbasaur's Revenge. Uh. <laughs> oh my goodness. The Bulbasaur Strikes Back. Are we doing Star Wars now too? <laughs> oh my Would Pikachu still look as cute in a Darth Vader helmet? Yes. yes. <laughs> like a sweeping declaration, yes. But <laughs> yes. Oh my god, and then there's like an Ivysaur saying it has the high ground. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'll leave now. I mean, only if you're willing to cut off the arms and legs of the Pikachu. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Or just, like, oh, the no. little tentacly, tentacly things of the ivy Thor and the Bulbasaur. Oh, my God. Oh, you just use a shuckle and you have its arms and legs inside its body, oh, so you don't have to cut them off. So the Kickstarter for uh, Afterlife Wandering Souls. For Bulbasaur, <laughs> the... <laughs> the Bulbasaur Strikes Backs. Bulbasaur John of Justice, yeah. <laughs> um, let's, Afterlife Wandering Souls. 
when does that run? May. And the the plan is the start of the month. Um, we're just getting a couple of things together. Um, so I don't know the exact date yet, but it's going to be in May. Do you have an idea of what you're looking for for goals for tier levels? We're hoping, or at least the goal at the moment, is going to be around 5,000 euros. And the book itself is going to be 30 um 99% sure on that, and you're going to get a free PDF with it. So, and then the PDF will be 10, um, and the book is going to be hardcover, full color. What What is 30 euros for the rest of the world that doesn't use Ooh, euros? Uh, $35? <laughs> I assume it's somewhere around there because euro is a little stronger. Yeah. Oh, sorry, so. it's, it's $39, $39 right oh, now. Sorry. It's the euro is much stronger. Okay. More. Cool. Do you have any idea what you want to do for uh, stretch goals? Have you thought that through yet? Or... Yeah. Okay. So we okay. have some cool things. Um, well, first Ooh, of all, I hope they're all Bulbasaurs. <laughs> we're gonna have guests. <laughs> we're gonna That's have guests. That's the highest right... tiers. <laughs> so... <laughs> <Shut up laughs> if someone gives me a hundred thousand dollars, I will write Bulbasaur into Afterlife Wandering Souls. Sweeping it, declaration. It, <laughs> yes, it's 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 an off-brand Bulbasaur. <laughs> it's it's Bulbasaurus. <laughs> Bulbs, but. <laughs> Soba, so, soba, bulb, sobble, okay. saboba. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wait. Uh, anyway, <laughs> saboba was Bulbasaur. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> please. So we have, we're gonna have some awesome guest writers come on and write limbos for the kind of in between stretch goals, but we also have a couple of books that we're hoping to open up, and one of them is gonna actually be a a guide for the unrequited. So let's say you lose all your will and you become like one of these evil people. Um, we're actually going to, if we reach the funding goal, to write a book about how actually you'd play a party of those people and what your goals would be. Nice. That's good. Especially for people who are, you know, not necessarily familiar with the system. That helps kind of get them used to it. Yeah. And then we have another thing I'm really excited about is actually um we're doing something and I, I don't know like if it's going to be a success or not. Like personally, I think it's really cool, but obviously I'm very biased, but we're creating something called a player's tome as an add on to Kickstarter. And what that is, is it's going to be a combination of a notebook, a character sheet and the base rules that all characters need. So you can kind of like flip it open, keep your notes in there, like reference a couple of powers and stuff like that that you may need. Um, and that's all going to be like typed in there. And so one of the stretch goals also is to like buff that out a little bit and make it more fancy. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Be handy. Like, I don't know, like I personally like that. Like I write a lot of rules in my notebook. So like I remember them or like my powers or my spell book and stuff. So I thought it'd be mm. cool to have that all in one place for players. It's actually nice to be able to, as a player, you know, have something that you have in front of you, you know, something that's yours, you can hold on to when you're playing. If you had any advice for new players or GMs uh, when they get their hands on Afterlife, uh, what's just a couple quick tips that you would give to them? Um, I think the advice I would give is don't be afraid to explore the strange because, you know, a very large part of Afterlife is really based around your characters and maybe mundane memories that you may have, at least like Earth-related memories. So I think mm. like when you go into Limbo's, um, and when you like set up those adventures for your characters and mm. your players, um, I just wouldn't be afraid to like, you know, pick strange things like make a tiger prince or something like that, that the players have to defeat and, uh, really run wild with it. Cause that's part of the joy of the setting. And the tiger prince's name is Tony, <laughs> Tony, the tiger prince. No, it's Bulbasaur. <laughs> it's Bulbasaur. It's absolutely Bulbasaur. We've gone down the Bulba hole. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Instead of the rabbit hole. Oh, no. The Bulba hole. Oh, God. Oh, dear. I suppose with that, um, <laughs> that's that's probably as good a place as any to, to wrap up. Um, so I want to thank Liz for coming on the show. Thank you, Liz. I want to thank Liz for dealing with us. Thanks for dealing this with us. This fun. For... Thank yeah. you guys for having me. I really appreciate oh, it. You're welcome. The digressions and all, that's, that's good. If uh, folks out there wanted to get some more information on Afterlife Wandering Souls, maybe before the Kickstarter launches, where could they go? Well, you can first go to our website, angryhamsterpublishing.com, and that has all the links. But we also have a free quick start out, and that's through DriveThruRPG. 
Um, but if you go to our website, you'll be able to find a link to that. And we're also pretty active on Twitter and Facebook. Um, on Facebook, okay. we're just Angry Hamster Publishing. And on Twitter, we're at Angry Hamster RPG. We can also link the, the quick start. I had a, another one. I, I got to put more mind points into this. All right, uh, Alex, if... You got to get more Bulbasaurs on that. <laughs> totally. uh, Alex, if uh, the folks out there wanted to find out more information about Delve, where could they go? You can find more information about Delve over at delvecast.com. Yeah, that's where all the Bulbasaurs live. You can find them over there and, um, and all the projects that we work on. Go, go ahead. While you're there... Why not check out our Patreon? You can uh, you can find all of like the unedited. You can find the uh, almost two hour version of this episode in its complete form for a dollar. Yeah, a total, not like per minute or anything. You can see how we went down this road. <laughs> you can see why it took us two hours to end this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few things that probably the the regular listeners will not end up hearing. <laughs> It's all good stuff. You 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 would probably love it. Go go support your favorite creators on Patreon or whatever they use. Yes, and, absolutely. And, and your favorite um, designers that are making awesome games for you to play. And if you are on our Patreon, uh, also thank you to our shiny level patrons who are supporting us over there, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. Oh, and uh, also you can find us on iTunes and Google Play and uh, Spotify now. You no, you can us. only find us on Patreon. You can only find us on Patreon. You can find us there, too. We're you can find us on right. some Bulbasaur's back. <laughs> riding off into the sunset. Yes, riding <laughs> off into the bright sunset so you can ca- use your hyper beam. I'm sorry, solar beam. And you know, with enough support, we will turn into a Venusaur. <laughs> and we'll be- <laughs> the flower will come out. <laughs> and we can have a solar beam. <laughs> so, something to think about. Anyway, um, you can find us out there. You can also find us on Twitter. I am at Satanium. I am at Bulbasaur. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. Bulbasaur. And also, <laughs> um, you were on Twitter, Angry Hamster? At Angry Hamster RPG. At Angry Hamster RPG. Excellent. Thank you again to Liz for being Thank on. Thank you, guys. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. Yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to keep no, that's it together. Fair. That's fair. I mean, and, uh, you don't have to keep it together. You can just laugh. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. After a long rest, you get all of your mind points back. It's good. All all of your laugh points come back. At you the take end anything the away life. from this episode. Remember this. <laughs> Remember this. That's the only important thing. Remember a world full of cannibalistic gummy bears, and also remember the Bulbasaurs. Remember the Bulbasaur. I feel like Sarah McLaughlin's got to be singing when you say that. <laughs> 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 In the arms of a trainer. <laughs> would you be a, Would you be an angel for a Bulbasaur? <laughs> Go to your God. local uh, Pokestop and uh, pick one up today. Uh, so anyway, thank you for listening, everybody, and we will see you on the next episode. Maybe if they don't revoke our license <laughs> to do this show. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>can you imagine like the Anakin scene where he's getting loaded into the Darth Vader suit, but it, it's Pikachu and he's going like, where's Ash? I need <gasps> to find Ash. No, stop <laughs> it. You're done. Cancel. <laughs> no, that's so sad. <laughs> but it I was thinking of the scene when he uh, took out all the, uh, the Jedi Academy children, honestly. Oh, no. The younglings. But that, the the younglings. The Pichus. Oh my goodness. It was the <laughs> Pichus. And the puzzles and minnows. Oh god. It does explain how force lightning works, though. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> you know? I think that that's how they did it. It's it's it, underneath the suit. It was actually a we we, we need to commission someone to do an all Pokemon rendition oh, of Star, Star Wars. Wars? Yeah. Oh man, there's uh-huh. casting. Uh that's 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 gonna be fun to do. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. I'm, I'm, <laughs> call me. We're gonna, call, call me. I mean, yeah, exactly. call you for casting or just because you want to talk to him? D- d- well, hey, you know what? He can make Detective Pikachu <laughs> work. I'm thinking that he could make, like, 
Pikachu Darth Vader work. Vader Chew? We're totally very off topic. I'm so sorry. I think I started this, but it was just a thought experiment that needed to be worked out. You know... It's the best thought experiment. This is, like, the best bonus episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is episode two. It's just we're just thinking about how we can cross over. Episode two, the Bulbasaur Strikes Back. Yeah, as I said. This is episode two, Bulbasaur's Revenge. (laughs) No, (laughs) Bulbasaur Strikes Back. Okay, Bulbasaur Strikes Back. Sorry. That's right. Or the Bulbasaur Wars. (laughs) <laughs> because the clone wars because of clone wars no no that would be ditto wars mm, if it's clone no. wars then you have to equate it to ditto oh but then it, i think it's more like ditto would probably be in like the captain i don't know the captain jigglypuff movie right because then you have the shapeshifters yes oh captain that would be great Jiggly. Jiggly, jigglypuff needs his own movie He's got too much personality to not to not be a a mainstay. That or Evie. <laughs> I just Sorry. mean I, I or, or oh. Jigglypuff is like the Yoda, right? Sorry, just to completely yes. switch back. I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it right. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I feel like you're my show mom, and I'm going to go out on stage. (laughs) Oh my god. You're going to do your tap dancing routine, and you're going to like it, Tina. You're going to love it. I imagine he's also there, like, with a pot of Vaseline, like, Vaselining your teeth right before you're going on the show. Yes. Yep, absolutely. You could just imagine me, like, crying on stage, trying to do a tap dance routine with Alex off stage, just kind of, smile, Nathan, smile. (laughs) (laughs) Bigger, bigger, jazz hands. <laughs> and that is how Delve ended. All right, so we're going to do... 